Yeah, I'm gonna come up and Welcome. Close. We're I'm so glad to see such a nice way. turnout tonight. Um, Manuel Hermano asked uh, the League of Women Voters if we could sponsor a program so that they could reach out to our community um, to provide information on the current status of immigration law um, and how changes and proposed changes may um, affect the Outer Banks. Uh, they have done a series of programs uh, targeted to the Hispanic community to help them understand what the requirements are and um, so they, they wanted an opportunity to reach out and we found that their suggestion was really quite compatible uh, with the league's mission which is to educate the community um, on current issues and also um, the National League of Women Voters policy on immigration includes uh, well several things but two in particular that I think are uh, apply here on the Outer Banks is that uh, they want to promote the reunification of families and meet the economic business and employment needs of the United States. So I'll turn it over now to Ama and the panel. All Thank right. You. Good evening everyone. Thanks so much again for, for coming. You came into uh, the projector. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to see, show by hands, how many people here feel like they they know the immigration law here pretty well. Yeah? How many of you, you know, maybe don't know too much, you just want to learn something today? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so most of you were in the uh, latter half, or the latter portion, not, not knowing much, which is perfectly fine, because our laws regarding immigration are messy, complicated, and always changing. Um, so I'm going to um, address three main questions right now, okay? First is going to be, why don't they just get in line? Um, that's a question that I get a lot from people that do not understand the law. Why don't they just get in line? Why do they have to be illegal? They should just, you know? So I'm going to um, talk about that first question. Second, I'm going to address what is a sanctuary city? What is a sanctuary jurisdiction? Because that's kind of a hot topic right now. You turn on the news and you're hearing about sanctuary city. So I'm going to talk about that. And finally, I'm going to talk about some of the actions that the current administration has taken. And in the interest of disclosure and transparency, I will let you all know that I do not support our current administration. And so some of the things that I say may reflect that. Um, so I will just let you know that. <laughs> Become a citizen, the end. Presentation's over, we can go home, we've solved the problem. Well, no, this is the so-called line. This is the immigration system, in a nutshell, in America, okay? Maybe there's some lines in there, there's some lines going up, down, sideways, there's some circles and you know shapes of some sort, but this is the immigration system. There is no line. It is a mythical line. It does not exist. There's no single line that people can just go through and suddenly they have lawful status. Rather, there are four primary ways that someone can get a green card. First way that most of us have heard about is through family. Second, through, um, through employment. Um, and Carlos will speak more about that. Um, third, Humanitarian avenues, such as um, refugee status um, and asylum. And a fourth way that a lot of people have never heard about, but that's the reason that I'm here today, because my father got his green card through the system, is the diversity visa lottery. And it's a system here where um, basically the U.S. tries to get um, green cards to people from those countries that don't have that many immigrants here. So it's a way to spice up the mix a little bit. Um, and so that's how my father got his green card and that's how I got my citizenship through him was because he got his green card through the lottery system. And even though these are you know, kind of lines, um, I will let you know that for many of the people here without lawful status, there is no line, there is no line for them to go through. There's no way for them to gain lawful status to get their green card. So let's talk about 
the, the, the first um, method, the first way. That'll be family. Now, family visas are limited <coughs> to certain close family relationships, okay? And it's new, and they are numerically restricted. When I say to certain close family um, relationships, it means you can't get a visa for your grandma. You can't get a visa for your uncle. It has to be, you know, your 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 spouse, sibling, um, child. For immediate relatives, that's usually the easiest way. How many of you have, you know, heard? Oh, um, you just need to marry a um, marry a citizen, then you get your green card. Yay! How many of you have heard, heard that? <laughs> that's partially true. That really is kind of the easiest way um, is to marry into it if everything else goes smoothly, okay? And the reason that that's the easiest way is because for spouses, parents, if the child is over, um, if the child um, is, is over 21, and for the, the unmarried children of U.S. citizens that are 21 or under, there is no numerical limit. Their visa's always there for them. Okay, so it's, you know, nice, quick, easy, one year, you probably have your visa, you know, wonderful. But for everyone else, for everyone else, numerical ceilings and backlogs. If you look at this chart right here, I don't know if you can see it. So where it says um, F1, do you guys see that? And then there's the, the line. Thanks, Carlos, you're so helpful. <laughs> F1, this is for... Um, unmarried children of U.S. citizens over the age of 21. Those dates there next to it, it means today they are only looking at applications that were filed on that date. So look at for Mexico, 15th June 1995. They are just now reviewing those applications that were filed in June 1995, 22 years ago. Wow. So if you're the unmarried child of a U.S. citizen over the age of 21 from Mexico, you, your, your line is 22 years long. <coughs> no one's gonna stay in line for 22 years. Okay, you're just gonna cross the border, right? Um, siblings, so um, F4, siblings of United States citizens. Let's look at the Philippines. October 15, 1993, that's 24 years. It's a 24 year long line. So these are the people that actually do have lines, that do have a means to become lawful residents. They have to wait in line for over 20 years. Wait in line for over 20 years. So it's just not reasonable. Now let's say you do everything right. Whoa, 22 years, I'm finally here, it's my turn. My, you know, and immigration says, yeah, it's your turn. You have a visa available for you. You can apply for your green card. You know, you can try to, um, to become a lawful permanent resident. Woo! Psych. Guess what? There is a thing called an unlawful presence bar. What does that mean? If you were in the United States unlawfully for over 180 days, the law says you are barred from getting lawful status. It could be for three years, it could be for um, 10 years, and for some it's just a permanent bar, period. You cannot gain lawful status. There is no line available for you because you were here unlawfully to begin with. There is a way to waive that bar. It requires you, that bar, to, to, to waive that bar requires you to leave the country to complete the application process, to have the bar waived. I've had clients that did that, left the country, going through the process, they go to their interview, maybe six months to one year later, hey, another surprise for you. We're gonna tell you you're still barred. We're going to say that you are a smuggler because you brought your child to the United States with you. You smuggled your alien child to the United States. So you're completely barred from getting lawful permanent status. So there are all these 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 bars, you know. Even when you try to do things right, even when it seems like there is a line for you, there are bars that can be slapped on you to where there's just nothing you can do. 
So for um, the unauthorized doc, um, <coughs> unauthorized um, immigrants that we have here, it's, it's just not, um, it just doesn't really make sense for them to try to go through it the legal way because you're either having to wait 20 years when you finally reach that length of time, you're risking so much to even try to become lawful in the country. And so um, that's what, um, what we have. The second way um, is employment. Um, employment is also not easy. You must generally have a job lined up with someone here who will sponsor you. And I think Carlos will talk more about that. And for permanent employment visas, the bar is usually really high. You you have to be some kind of like super genius researcher, professor, or you have a lot of money. You have between five hundred thousand and a million dollars to invest in a business here that will create fifty jobs or more for U.S. workers. Okay, so that's it for employment. So again, so why don't they just get in line? There is no single line for people to join, so that's one. Two, for many of the, um, the unauthorized people here, there is no line for them because they don't have a you know, spouse, they don't have a child who's a U.S. citizen, you know, so there's just no avenue for them. And for those that there might be an avenue, it's just not feasible, you know, it's just risky. You know, would you want to risk leaving the country and then you're told you can't come back anyway? Even when you try to do things the right way, they decided to slap you with something else and then your kids are now here with no mom or with no, right? So um, that's, that's why they don't just get in line, okay? Um, I'm gonna talk about sanctuary jurisdictions. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I will try and get through quickly. So to explain sanctuary jurisdictions, I'm going to give you a little scenario. <coughs> I'm gonna pick on Matthew, Kale Devil Hills police officer, as, as well as John. So, <laughs> scenario. Kale Devil Hills officer pulls over and arrests Joe Immigrant for resisting, delaying, and obstructing an officer, RDO, which is my least favorite charge in the entire world. Um, the immigrant, because it's such a correct charge, but anyway, so the immigrant is booked into the Dare County Detention Center. Dare County Detention Center runs the immigrant's fingerprints, right, because that's what they always do when they book someone, you know, into the, the jail, standard practice. Well, fingerprints are shared with FBI. FBI shares fingerprints with ICE. So ICE has the fingerprints of whatever unauthorized person has been fingerprinted. And what happens is if ICE says, you know what, we, um, we want this guy. Dare County Center, we're sending you a detainer. We're sending you a hold request. Has anyone ever heard of that? A detainer? Okay. Detainer is a written request from ICE to the local jail asking that the jail hold the individual for up to 48 hours after the person could have and should have been released. I'll explain. If Mr. Immigrant is picked up on Thursday, magistrate sets a bond of $2,000. Immigrant's wife posts the bond Friday. Under our laws, he should be free to go. I mean, he's posted the bond. Liberty, the Constitution, you know, hey, right? No, no, no. If I send a detainer and the jail honors the detainer, the jail can hold him until Tuesday, okay? Because that 48 hours does not include weekends or holidays. So he's being held, although he's posted his bond and should be free to go, if the jail says, yeah, we'll hold him for you, they, they have until Tuesday to keep holding him for ICE to come. Whether or not the local agency or, or the local jail complies with the detainer request determines whether or not it is a sanctuary jurisdiction, okay? And I'm gonna let you know right now, Dare County Detention Center honors detainer requests. Just FYI. Um, an example of an RDO? What would somebody get pissed off? <laughs> but RDO, um, let's 
see, they get pulled up. You and and this is where you know, I absolutely love my boyfriend, and, but I am a criminal defense attorney. So, <laughs> but um, you know, someone gets picked up, and you you guys can tell me if I'm you know wrong, but um, maybe they were um, or it was suspected that they were driving while drunk. They were pulled over. Turns out they're not drunk, but they refused to cooperate to um, to cooperate with the police. So they wouldn't show their ID. They were being you know mouthy. They wouldn't write. So that's resisting, delaying, and obstructing the officer's work. Right? Is that right? Basically. All right. Cool. Yeah. So that's an RDO. Hey, Emma, so um. You can take a few more minutes if you want to. Take a few more minutes yeah. if I want to. Okay. Yeah. Feel free. <laughs> So century jurisdiction, at least five states in the U.S. have laws that limit how much the local police can cooperate with federal immigration agents. So we have at least five states. California is one, New York is one, right? And at least 633 counties have the same. And if you all watch the you know, news or, 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 or read news, last week a San, San Francisco judge temporarily blocked this administration's January executive order calling to withhold funds from sanctuary jurisdictions, right? Yeah. What? And I've heard the sheriff here say this, and I've heard the sheriff in Curtis say, we want the immigrant community, community to feel that they are safe, and we want them to report such and such so they're not afraid of the police. And I believe the sheriffs, is that what is happening in their community and in Curtis? I, I believe them too, and that's what I have heard, you know, the sheriff as saying, and I, I completely believe that, but so this this might maybe explain, this next slide might explain, okay? So North Carolina is not a sanctuary jurisdiction, okay? In 2015, North Carolina passed a law that prohibits local governments from failing to cooperate with ICE. So Dare County Detention Center doesn't have a choice but to cooperate and share those fingerprints because by law, North Carolina has required them to do so. Okay? Does that kind of answer your, answer your question? Well, it's a very gray area. It, 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 Pitt County Sheriff has probably because he, they accused him of you know, making the county a sanctuary yeah. county and he had to write a letter to the editor. And, that was just recently, right? That yeah, was, it was. Like, Last week, I think, yeah. So, it, so North Carolina has this law prohibiting sanctuary jurisdictions. Okay. Now, like you said, um, Pitt County Sheriff came um, um, got in trouble last week for supposedly not following that law. Um, I think Winston Salem has been in trouble. Um, Durham has been in trouble. Chapel Hill. So there are there are jurisdictions that are still saying. No, like we're not going to enforce federal law. Like this is your area. Like we just want to arrest criminals. Like we 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 care about whether or not they committed a crime, not whether or not they're here lawfully or not lawfully. So um, and then <laughs> and on fe February twenty eighth of this year, um, there was a a, a a a bill filed in the Senate, North Carolina Senate. Good on North Carolina. <laughs> that intends to to do what Trump just got a slap on the wrist for trying to do, which is withhold funding from local governments that are sanctuary jurisdictions. So that's something that North Carolina is trying to pass because, yeah. So <laughs> that is where we are as far as sanctuary jurisdictions in North Carolina. Okay. Um, I hope I explain sanctuary jurisdictions kind of clearly, but if not, please feel free to ask me questions, you know, um, after we've gone through all the panelists. Um, immigration actions that the current administration has taken. Travel ban, we've all heard about it. We, it was all over the news, so um, I won't even touch it, um, except that um, there's an appeals hearing on May 15th for um, the Hawaii one, and then on May 8th in Maryland. So we'll be watching the news and, and see what happens with that executive order that is 
supposedly not a Muslim ban. Um, as far as border security, you've all heard, build a wall, build a wall, build a wall, right? Well, um, my understanding is the budget that was approved through September of this year does not allocate funds for a wall. Right. So we don't know, so we don't know where that stands right now. Um, one thing though that I think goes unnoticed is that one of the things that he wants to do is to allocate resources for new detention facilities. Okay? Our administration wants to detain as many immigrants as possible. My understanding is that since January, ICE has been more present in Dare County Detention Center than it has since um, at least for the last few years. Um, I have a friend who practices criminal defense very actively here, and that's what she's told me, that um, it's been really <coughs> bad this year. I mean, it, the, and, and um, there have been more detentions this year. I can't remember the statistic, but a whole lot more this year than there were last year by this time. Um, what else has he done? <laughs> Um, we're trying to hire more um, um, Customs and Border Patrol um, officers. I think that number was 5,000 5, more, and we're trying to hire 10,000 ICE officers. Um, there has been um, the weekly decline detainer outcome report, which is, it's supposed to try and shame those um, sanctuary jurisdictions that do not honor ICE detainers. So that's published weekly. And then there's also a number that's um, been established for people to call and report um, crimes committed by aliens. And I don't know if any of you saw on the news last weekend that people have been calling saying that they've been spotting aliens, like they've been spotting BT so yeah, extra, so that's kind of backfiring, but that's you know that number has been established as well. And I mean, I think you know, I mean, of course, we all want to know what's happening nationally, but it's important to pay attention to what's happening in North Carolina. Okay. Um, two eighty seven G agreements. Has anyone heard of two eighty seven G agreements? Okay. So we know about secure communities, which is the um, fingerprint um, sharing that's done with our local jails and with ICE. 287G agreements is a step further. It's an actual partnership. It's an actual signed contract between local law enforcement agencies and ICE, in which ICE delegates some of its job to local law enforcement officers. So they get to perform legitimate immigration enforcement actions, like serving ICE warrants, like questioning about the background of um, people. Just this spring, Henderson County and Mecklenburg County both signed 287G agreements with ICE. So now we're up to five counties in North Carolina that have 287G agreements with ICE. I don't know, actually. I don't know. So, is it the county executive who makes this agreement? How is it determined? I, so, I've seen it was signed by the Mecklenburg County one was, I think, signed by the Mecklenburg County chief of, you know, the, uh, commissioner? Deputy, but, but I mean, it is with the law enforcement agency. Oh, it's itself. A law yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's, I mean, so now we have Wake, in Wake County, any, any immigration advocate that practices there will tell you that it has not been good for our immigrants at all. I mean, it is, it is terrible. Um, if, um, if an immigrant gets picked up by law enforcement in Wake, it's almost guaranteed that ICE will come and pick them up, okay? Um, because they have some law enforcement, law enforcement um, officers there that act as ICE. So you don't have to wait 
for ICE to come, they're already there in the jail through the law enforcement officers, okay? And then, this is my last slide, employment-based immigration. Um, I'll just say that um, that hasn't been touched too much by the current administration, um, and especially thankful, um, H, um, H2 visas, which are the visas for seasonal workers, which um, I believe that's what most of the workers that come here to the Outer Banks to work, those have not been touched, thankfully, for the employers on the Outer Banks. So Carlos is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and these are some of the resources that I use. Um, these are all the final two, of course, government um, resources, but that's, uh, they're, they're usually very helpful to know what the actual law is, what the law says. And then um, the first four are also very helpful. So that's all I have to share with you right now. I, you know, have to pack a lot into 15 minutes. There's probably more than 15 minutes. But please feel free to ask any questions after everyone's done. Oh, is, is that something you can share? The, the PowerPoint or the yeah. resources? Yeah, sure, mm -hmm. sure. I'll we can put it on the website. However, we can. Oh yeah, we can put that on on, on the website. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. We have I think guys have more. If you want us to hold questions to the end. Yes. Yeah, okay. I didn't realize I didn't ask. Okay. Yes. They're all. They're all going to speak. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. I have to close this. Should out. I stand or can I sit? You can stand. Just close this. Are, are you standing or are you sitting? Are you going to do it? I don't know. I'm yet. just going to close it so it's not distracting. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if I should sit or stand. 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 Okay. <laughs> And I can stand back here, I guess, or I don't know. Um, well, my name is Carlos Babylonia. As I was introduced, um, I have been with Hatters Realty for the last three years in April. This, you know, we, I just turned three in the company. From before that, right before I started there, I was working in the Coast Guard. I actually did both. Through my re last three months, I was trying to get a job before I got out of the Coast Guard because I couldn't afford living anywhere, especially here in the Outer Banks, without a job, even with a military retirement. Um, so I decided, you know, fortunately the job came open at Hatteras Realty for a maintenance manager. With the little experience that I had in the Coast Guard, I was able to qualify for that job at a pay rate that would help me live here and stay here for another few years. Our house had a for sale sign for about six months, so we were leaving for the second time, mm. supposedly, <laughs> um, but we didn't. Um, and and and. A lot of things have affected the reason why we stay here. Some of you, I, I mean, I lost an election last year. And I, I don't think some of you know me for that, but 25% of the voters voted for me. So I think that I was very fortunate enough to get the word of those 25% because nobody knows me. I mean, I've been here for three, five years, sorry. And, and I mean, 25% I, 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 of the voters for Hatteras, to me, that was pretty good. Yeah. And, and, and I promise the folks at Manuel Armano while I was running for Board of Education that I will help them after even if I win or lose. So I fulfilled my promise and I, when Jessica called me and asked for my help, I decided that yes, I will be here whenever impossible. Um, because I am fortunate or, or I was fortunate enough to be born in a place where I don't need a citizenship to get a job. Um, I, I have it already, I was born with it. I have the second language to help me with that too. I've been able to use it in the Coast Guard. I've been able to use it everywhere I've been. I told that to my kids. They still didn't listen to me. They didn't learn it as well. They still know a little bit, <laughs> enough to understand and talk to grandpa. Say, te quiero, ay, te traño. Yeah, 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 uh -huh. bye, I love you, you know. But, <laughs> but um, it, it's through them who, we've, who, who we decided to stay here in this community and decided to help more. My wife's sitting right there, her name is Rosalie, and she didn't get introduced at the beginning, but I think that she should be the one introduced because she's the one that, I don't have a right hand or a left, you know, it's all her. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I have to say, you know, I thank her because she was the one that got us our house, she's the one that, you know, helped me find my job after the Coast Guard. So, it was a team effort in our home, and, and that's, that's kind of like our, our philosophy that we teach our kids is how we live our life, how we live with others at work, at church, or wherever you go in sports. You know, you can play a game of basketball, and our son is about, he was a team captain this year. Um, and we have the worst team in the, in the district, in the, I mean, it's, it's horrible. I mean, the, the coach, the coach went as bad as to uh, introduce my kid, the captain of the team, he got the coach's award because he always responded to text. <laughs> so, 
so that's you know and, and again this is something that to me it hit me hard because I, I, I mean it, it's something that you when you do a sport and you have a different different kids from different homes, different cultures, and they're playing together, and they learn how to play together for that 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever time they're in that court. They're expressing to us how to behave in public with others. We don't know how to do that most of the time. When we're in front of people that we don't understand and we don't know how to treat, we treat them with disrespect via facial impressions or, or, or you know, whatever we do. And I, I, again, I was fortunate enough to be born in a place where I don't need the citizenship or whatever, but I was fortunate enough to also <laughs> have light skin and a second language. So join the Coast Guard and first thing, basic training. Three Puerto Ricans go to basic training together. So we're like, yes, you know, I'm not going by myself, um, leaving an island and a plane to go to another airport. It was a long process, but nonetheless, you know, it was very fortunate to me to find people that I was with and helped me throughout the seven and a half weeks where I received prejudice because of my speaking and whatever it was, and I still do, I mean, I still do, and I, I, I learn how to deal with that. But I don't think that everybody knows how to deal with that in either end, and, and how to give feedback back. So sometimes, you know, at work, I'll have people, <laughs> what did you just say? It's like, hey, come on, I'm trying here, it's my second language, you know? <laughs> this is not something that comes out, hey, I know how to speak, you know, and I, I just know two. I mean, some folks know three, four, five, six, seven. We in the United States, we do a horrible job at educating our kids and not teaching them two languages since they're kids, since they're this old, you know, I did a bad job in my house, we did a bad job by not forcing them more, but it was also because of that same pressure that they receive in the community because our kid was forced in an English Anglo community. He felt he was white like me where he was basically expected to speak English and whenever he tried to speak, he didn't speak. So he was afraid. We started speaking English at home. Whew. Done. No problem. He speaks. I mean, and the doctor said he doesn't have a speech impediment. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> so, well, <laughs> and those are some of the experiences that I as a white Hispanic have faced and 16 and a half years in the Coast Guard and five, you know, three working in the private sector. I mean, I can go on and on. I have 10, 15 minutes. I thought I didn't, I have enough to say, but I think I may have too much to say um, from just experiences. But um, here in Hatteras, three years um, in this company, in the Coast Guard, I had to take, send people back home as a, as a law enforcement officer of immigration uh, law enforcement officer that the Coast Guards are, and I was one. And had Cubans tell me, please, sir, in Spanish, no me mandes para atrás, don't send me back. You know, they're right there. I can see the beach from the boat. And I had to tell them, I'm sorry, sir, it's my job. I have to. So here, I mean, as a, in the private sector, it's not the same, but I had somebody very close to me, and you will guess my wife. Um, she had the job, and I mean, and, and, and I know that this is going to be on YouTube, and, and we are... Um, we work for the company, and it wasn't the company's fault. But about three years ago, background checks started for employment. Guess what happened to all those employees that were working for us that didn't pass their background check? Bye-bye. You don't have a job anymore just because. You've been working for us for this long, and you're a great employee, but guess what? Just because you're from there, we can't have you. It was her job to go to them one by one and tell them, Sir, ma'am, I'm sorry. You're no longer an employee of us. And that's very hard for a person to take, but it's a decision that is not made by the person. But the people, they see that person and they take it upon them to decide, well, it's their fault. They're the ones that are doing this to us. So we took, you know, some companies did take a bad hit, hit when that happened, especially us in the island where we were letting go of migrants and stuff. But it was law. It wasn't the companies, you know, we were have to <laughs> abide by the law. Now, we were short staff, of course. And we still are. <laughs> to this day, we're paying for that. To this day, every year when it comes to recruiting season, this year I went to, as far as Edenton. I was there a few weeks ago recruiting people in Edenton to work for Hatteras Realty, to work for us to, you know, come and, 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 and do the seasonal jobs that we need. You know, we have lack of, you know, uh, applicants. Um, <laughs> I don't even want to go into numbers. But I know the H2, which is what I also need to talk about, that's a long process, and they the, they're the ones that help us when we don't have employees right now. When housekeeping doesn't have enough cleaners and they get a house that needs to be cleaned last minute, hey, summer crew, which is the H2 guys, hey, we need you. 
at this house ASAP. Those guys can, I mean, that group of folks, they're so disciplined. They've been coming here for over 15 years, some of them. They were recruited by Stuart Cowes, the founder of the company. And he, they have, a, they have uh, memories. I picked them up in the airport twice already. And when they come, all they want is to come here and, 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 and just do what they can to help. I mean, <laughs> that's all they come here. They work. They don't have a life. They work. They work, they work. They go shopping, they work. Shopping, work. Now, the myth that they buy stuff and they send it back home, well, guess what? They're still buying it here. And they're buying stuff for, uh, from us. So they're spending their money here. They're eating here. They're doing their, I mean, these folks have such a great, it, it's just a relationship. Some of them, this is their, only their third, fourth time. Some of them, like I said, have been come for 15 years, families, brothers and sisters, and they love it here. They, they, they come here for eight months of the year. Eight months of the year. Our military goes out for a month, and I mean, it's a sacrifice that is well, you know, and, and but these folks are also sacrificing eight months of their lives every year to come work for us here in the, in, in the Outer Banks. And, and, and this year, I know for a fact that Whitecap, um, Linens, and Ocracoat Realty couldn't get their H2s. So yes, we've been affected by H2s. Whitecap had a loss of 40 plus. That's 40 plus staff that they didn't get. And if they're in the same position that we're at, where the local pool of, of people that we think that they're getting their jobs stolen, <laughs> sorry, but that's also a myth. No jobs are being stolen here. I have plenty of vacancies for anybody who wants to get a job. You can drive down the road and you can see the signs that said, looking for ha housekeeping maintenance, anything, any jobs, everybody's looking. I don't know up here, but in Hatteras Island, we are. And, and it's very hard um, because every year it gets harder and harder to get people that qualify or want to do the job. Um, but uh, with the H2s, again, it, it, we, 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 we rely on them for everything and anything when it comes to, to taking care of, you know, filling the gap for us. Uh, with the J1s, which are students, we bring them, and some of them, they come from Lithuania, which fortunately our boss is from Lithuania, so he has a good pool of them. But again, we ha the process is so long, and, and especially for the H2s, they have to go through, it's almost, a, I think it's a four-day process where they go in Mexico. They have to fly to Veracruz. They have to go to the capital and spend days there going through getting their visa. They have to go, <laughs> it, it, the final thing is an interview. Every year they have to get an interview. So imagine that every year you have to get interviewed to do a job that you've been doing for 15 years. Nice. Who's gonna wanna do that job? I mean, you don't feel appreciated when every time they have to make sure that you're good enough to do a job. So my thing is, as, as, as an employer, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm having difficulties filling our employment with what we have. And we have so many folks in the community that I've been with them in their homes and I've <laughs> have Christmas dinners and, and illegal status, but criminals, they're not because they have families. They're, they're, all they want to do is do their part. They come to me and ask me, what can I do to get a job? I want a job. Hire me. I mean, can you? No, I'm sorry. You have to have a piece of paper that says that you're good. And to me, that's just very hard because again there's so many that need a job and they have to find it you know under the table and and then again who, who who's to blame for the money not going into the economy when those folks are trying to do their part but we're not allowing it to happen so i do um i don't have that much more i mean uh Stuff that didn't get, uh, you know, in the beginning, like I said, I, I did run for the Board of Education. Um, I do, uh, at the church, uh, I, I was very active for, you know, my wife has now taken that spot and she's the teacher for the um, um, uh, First Communion Kids. Um, I used to be in charge of outdoor service, the youth group and all that, but we had, it was very hard to compete again with the community in Hatteras itself, and this is something that I said in one of the forums that we had in Hatteras, in Buxton, in the Fessenden Center. You don't see young people out in any of these. And I'm sorry if I offend or, or, or make anybody feel bad, but some of you folks shouldn't have to worry about these subjects and should be home being able to relax. And people like us in their 30s and 40s should be out here taking care of their things. So I do thank you for coming here on behalf of your kids, your grandkids, and hopefully they will use you as role models to be more active in the community because it takes sometimes folks like Alma 
I mean, I, 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 and I'm not from here. I mean, and some of you, I don't know if you were born and raised here, but you, you know, this is our community and we all have to help it, not just some. It's an everybody thing that we have to help each other. Learn your, you know, know your neighbors, learn who they are before you judge them and treat them like criminals because they may be that person that give you a helping hand when your car has a flat <laughs> when, when you have a community event, those folks are the ones that are willing to give their cash here for whatever you want because they know that they cannot use it for anything else. So if there's any questions, I will answer questions too after um, Jessica and Kay are done. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Maybe if you want to ask one question while I'm messing with it. <laughs> a question. Um, uh, just a minute ago, uh, when Carlos said about the H-2 visas, um, couldn't get them, or could, some employers can't get them. Did you mean there's they, an allotment of number of H-2 visas, or you can't get people to want to apply for the H-2 visas? I didn't well, understand. What happened was, I mean, in, 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 yeah, there's an allotment of H-2 visas that are granted per year, and this year, with all the changes in the laws, with all that they, the Oak Brook, those two companies, for, that what I know for certain is that their process wasn't started early enough for them to get into that pool. Whereas us, we've been doing it for so long that we have um, almost, we have an agency also that helps us with that. So they were able to cap, you know, get our, our, our allotment early. So, but yeah, they reduced the allotment of H2s, if I'm not mistaken, in the outer banks, yeah. Any other questions right now? It's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name's Jessica, and I was I had some notes, but I thought I'd tie it into what both Ama and Carlos said. My father was a refugee from Germany. He had political asylum. He was active against the Nazis in the early 30s. Within six months of Hitler coming into power, my father was active against him. And he came, he was blacklisted, put in jail, and came to the States. He had sponsors, he had a PhD already, so I'm one of those lucky ones too, who, and he was one of the lucky ones too, that he had refugee status, he was a political refugee, and came to the United States in 1935. And he became a citizen, and actually became a captain in the U.S. Army, and went back and fought against Hitler, and he was part of Army Intelligence and helped plan D-Day because he interrogated high-ranking German prisoners that were held in Great Britain because there was no front then. I mean, so that was my background. And he was also, the only people that were active against Nazis then were the communists and the Marxists. So when Carlos was talking about people being tough on him, here I am, come from educated family, nice white skin, <laughs> And I had German parents, and I was born in 1950 when he came back, and my mother had a very thick German accent. Mm -hmm. So I was shunned a little bit in public school for that reason, and I couldn't say, well, they were the good ones, they were the communists, because then we were, <laughs> 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 we were in the McCarthy period then. <laughs> so I refused to speak German. So they said, my father had a sabbatical and I went to school in Germany, three different schools when I was in second grade and learned German all over again. And then came back and started doing what they call code switching. I wasn't really sure if I was speaking German or if I was speaking, um, oh, I want to stop this. Oh, that's right, it's on timer. I have to, hold on, I'm gonna stop this thing now. And show. Oh, that's right, I'm going to give you my introduction first, I'll start it again. So, um, <laughs> I came back and they were teasing me again. Then I refused to speak German until 1965. And he sent me back to boarding school in Germany. And this was during the, Viet <laughs> this was during the Vietnam War and I was a dirty American. <laughs> so then, um, this is a little bit of a segue if we're going for entertainment. I graduated from high school in 67 and I was supposed to go to Barnard and instead I went to Haight-Ashbury. So that was 50 years ago, the summer of love. Definitely. <laughs> and, um, 
and they had to do my education later with a child and all that kind of stuff. Married a Puerto Rican, a dark-skinned bilingual Puerto Rican, lived in Vermont, and had rocks thrown at my house, and was called an end lover. Oh. <laughs> So I've had, a little, even though I have all the privilege, I have the brains, the looks, the white skin, I have a lot of empathy for when that, that happens. And I know that it makes me angry, like, and I know I can deal with it, and I know that for me it's just a little passive moment. I mean, it's not every breathing minute of my life. So I came to the Outer Banks in 84 after a not too pleasant divorce, had three children to raise, and that's why I went into real estate, to make money. But I knew that I wanted to do something real, something with people, you know, from the, something to make my father proud for everything that he had done. And so my goal was that by the time I was 50, I'd have the house paid off and the girls through college and I could do what I wanted, which was teaching. So I was a closet graduate student while I was managing a real estate company. And I got a, a master's degree in teaching English to speakers of other languages. and wrote up a proposal for our superintendent saying that we really needed some more ESL teachers and it got approved, but then I had to compete for the position. So, <laughs> so that's how I started with ESL. Now the presentation I was going to show you, if I can get it back to where it's supposed to go, is, not my, I'm just going to close this for a second. I'm changing my whole approach. <laughs> Tying into what Amma said about law, this is the good news about education. The children in the schools are protected in the schools. And there were three Supreme Court cases. And the first one was Lau v. Nichols. And th in that case, it said, just because you give the child a desk and a book, that is not equal education. That you had to overcome the educational barriers. You had to provide a true education. You couldn't just say, and that was, that was a lawsuit that was started by a Chinese family in, in California. So that put the pressure on people to actually provide a real education and address the strategies and things that needed to be done for people to actually learn a language and learn the content of math and science and social studies. Then on top of that, there was another case called Castaneda versus Picard where they came up with a way to measure whether that was happening. And, and you had to have it it had to be based in sound theory. You know, you couldn't just put somebody in a closet and put on a strobe light and say, speak English, and then let them out of the door a day later, and it worked. You know, it had to, it's, it's almost that bad sometimes. But it, <laughs> so it had to be sound, and it had to, you had to actually do it, and then you actually had to have results. And that's good and bad. It's good to have the pressure do that. The bad part is that it led to a lot of testing, a lot of, um, I wouldn't say equitable ways of, of measuring whether there was really progress there or not, but the intent started out to be good with no child left behind, but it got, it got kind of rough. Yes. And then the third one, which is really important to our children here, was Filer versus Doe. And in that one, the, these are all Supreme Court decisions. The Supreme Court ruled that under the 14th Amendment, all children have a right to a public education up to the age of 21 regardless of where they were born, regardless of their citizenship status, just they all had a guarantee to that education. So the good news is that when the children come to school, they're protected, they're supposed to be getting a good education. And it was a big learning curve when I started in Dare County in, what was it, 2002? Is that right, Nancy, about then? I mean, the normal thing for registration was to ask for a social security card. That was part of the thing that you did when you registered a child. Well, they didn't have it. Some of them don't even have birth certificates if they, you know, left the country in a hurry. So there was a lot of learning curve here because when I first moved here, I didn't hear very much Spanish. I couldn't really keep my Spanish going too well, you know. And then I started hearing a little bit more and a little bit more. So when that magic 50 came along and I got to choose my new career, I started seeing Goya products in the supermarket. I started hearing Spanish, and that's what I'll do. I can do this. I speak Spanish. I can speak English. I know what it's like to learn another language. I know what it's like to have to go back and forth between cultures and languages. So that's why I started. And my very first year, there were maybe 65 ESL students, and English second language students in Deer County. And my first year, I was in, there was one teacher in Manio, and a part-time teacher at the first flight schools. 
and I was three days in Kitty Hawk, two days in Hatteras, because we had to um, oh, we had to provide a parody and education. You know, if there were only were only like seven kids in Kitty Hawk and five kids in Hatteras. That's why Kitty Hawk got me for three days, and Hatteras got me for two. By the end of the year, Hatteras had doubled. Hatteras was up to twelve or fifteen. At the end of that very first year. And Kitty Hawk stayed stable, and everything else kept growing and growing. And so the second year, I was in Manual Elementary School, and I thought I died and gone to heaven. I had 35 students. See, I could really do stuff. And then by the time I retired, after 14 years, there were 322 English language learners in Deer County, spread over 11 schools. Over seven, I think 740 students have parents at home that speak a language other than English. So it's really changed a lot. And so I didn't really retire because what I'm doing now, I'm doing for free instead of getting paid. She is. <laughs> but the first thing I wanted to show you, if I can get this thing to go back and work again, was a letter from a student. We were thinking about the stress of the teachers that didn't know how to communicate with the kids. And me thinking, how am I going to just touch everybody and, and magically fix everything and have them learn math and science. But the kids, how about, how did they feel? And I have this wonderful letter from a kid, and I, if I can get this to come up again. Okay, this is Lena. I was feeling so horrible on the first day of school, they told me to speak English. I got in trouble. So the next day, they took me to a field trip. This woman showed me everything. I got scared, so I went running to the bus. The third day of school, I had friend. On the fourth day of school, my teacher asked me to spell dictionary. <laughs> that was my favorite. He called, his name was Leonel, and he called himself Lion, because Leon is Lion. He called himself Lion. So the next slides that are coming through while I talk are just going to transition through showing the kinds of things you had to do. The children needed to learn how to write. I would pair them up so they could help each other. And in this one, they're, they're, you can see they're talking. And, and using the whiteboard was really easy because it got rid of fear. You can erase it. It goes right. away. You know, it's not paper and, and red ink and that kind of thing going on. And these girls were in second grade. They were doing a project on insects. And the thing in the boy, my room had to work for all these different grades. Here, these guys are measuring. This is math. They are, you know, a quarter. A quarter is money, a quarter is a fourth of something. A there are all kinds of things. Volume is how loud something is and how much space it takes up. I mean, there's a table, it could be a chart, it can be the table you're on. So when you're teaching math, you have all these different multiple meaning words. So they, we were making Play-Doh, and they got to measure and make Play-Doh and roll out and make Play-Doh cookies with Arthur's Christmas cookies, if anybody remembers that. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> This is this is Haiti studying a worm. We had to do we had to do science in third grade already. Um, evaluate whether your hypothesis was correct or incorrect, and say why in three complete sentences. Well, Haiti staring at the worm. She's got. Sheet there. And this is the map. A lot of the classrooms had roll down maps. I didn't, but I found it was much better to make it. I draw the map in front of them. They could move the labels. You can see the equator's hot. That's why it's in red. You know, and the land is green. And they would help color the map and, and move it in. And they actually, this was in Manny. I was there for six years. They won the geography B. These up kids won the geography B because I was so big on where are you from and where are you going and what's north, south, and east and west and what's the difference between a county and a country and a continent. And here, this was using science again. I had a oh, where were they from? Coastal resources or something. Putting together whale bones. And there was so much pressure to get everything done. This was third grade again. Big tested year. And they had to know fiction, and they had to know nonfiction, and they had to know science, and they had to learn English. They had to do everything. So I put together a big whale unit that covered science, and it covered language, and it covered oh, everything I could think of to put it together. And the basis of it was Moby Dick. And I got a graphic novel of Moby Dick, and I had these third grade language learners reading Moby Dick. By now, they knew about the geography. They could cover the voyage of the Pequod. 
They knew what was happening with whales. They knew what whales had to do. They knew about spouts and migrating and all of that. So by the time they were reading Moby Dick, they were they knew what they were doing. The guy on the left was a newcomer. He's he's going word by word. You know, I had to do a lot of translating for him. And the guy on the right was could could handle it a lot better. I always sat next to him. And so I had third grade that could do call me Ishmael. You know, and they had to do vocabulary, so you can't really see it too well, but they had the, the purple is they had to put things in sequence, because that was important. The blue button in the middle, they got to choose three words, vocabulary words, and define them in their own words. And in green, it's facts about whales. The bottom left, you see they had to make a map, and then compare it to a map that was in the book. And then they could write their, they could, took a quote from the book. And then say something about the best part of the book. That's <laughs> I love that so cute. Book. See, I won the spelling bee that the retired teachers <laughs> put on that spelling bee. Right. I got a bonnet. Yes. And the kids loved it. So the spell that was that was the prize. You got to wear the spelling bee. Thing. <laughs> so I was doing everything from kindergarten learning the alphabet to doing. Call me Ishmael to doing science experiments with worms. <laughs> and that's a lot that kids need to learn. Um, they need to learn their sight words. And that's really hard because in Spanish, N can be in or on in English. And it almost sounds the same. The N and on sounds the same. And if you just learn these words in, on, and don't know what they mean, it goes nowhere. So I made all these cards that use every single sight word in a sentence, and they can learn whatever they wanted to. Because you wouldn't know the difference between here, I can't hear you, and here, mm -hmm. like here, unless it's in a sentence. And then they had to copy it down. And I give that to newcomers, to kindergartners, to fifth graders, anybody that needs to learn language. <laughs> <laughs> I went for entertainment value. This was a Bloom ball. Have you heard about Bloom's taxonomy? He takes, right. he no. takes education mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. lowest to the highest. Yep. And we had all the different levels of taxonomy when we studied explorers, and he did Marco Polo. And so we did everything from describe, they had to create a map about the voyage, and, and they had to take a quote, mm -hmm. one thing that the, the explorer said, and so we, we took it all the way up from describe and remember all the way up to evaluate and create. And he was pretty proud of that blue ball. The whole school. By the time I'd been there for a while, instead of people being afraid, oh, we don't want the kids here, you fix them, they were saying, give me the kids. We want them. The parents are supportive. They're, t they're fun to work with. We want them in our classroom because you'll come help us. The custodian, Louis from Peru, would come in and play. But that was a poetry lesson. He beat out the rhythm on the drums. And the teachers were wanting to get the kids. It was fabulous because the parents, were, the parents would say, your job is to get an education. You know, if you called a parent, they wouldn't say, oh, my little Johnny didn't do that, you know. <laughs> They would support you, and they invited teachers. This was on Dr. Seuss Day, and so she, she was reading the Spanish, and I was reading the English. She was much more dressed up than I was for Dr. Seuss Day. <laughs> so we started, the parents started getting braver about coming into school. So that, it's nice that the law, you know, I'm seeing that all my captions are on the ceiling instead of in front of the picture, but it's <laughs> technological. <laughs> and see? You can mm -hmm. even be president. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Brian dressed up as George Washington on President Day. His mother made the curls with white pipe cleaners. And there he is. You can even be president one day. Now these most of these kids are the ones that were born here. So they can they can be president someday, you know. And I forget what my last one is. That might be my last one. It is. That's it. <laughs> Minus, as introduced, I'm the Family Literacy Director for Mono Al Hermano, and I do not have an inspirational story for how I got into this. The other three have these beautiful stories, but I kind of just <laughs> fell into it. Um, there were two nuns from Mexico who went to the Catholic Church, and they needed help teaching ESL classes. So my daughter was in middle school at the time, and she was part of the Peace and Justice Youth Program, and she volunteered to teach English with the nuns. So I, was, I live in Kitty Hawk, and I was driving down to Holy Trinity, which is a nags head every night to take her. 
And um, one day when I went to pick her up, I went upstairs and one of the nuns was up there. One of them didn't speak any English. The other one had very limited English skills, but they were struggling to try and teach these English classes. And I heard the whole group going spleen because they were just repeating everything that they heard from a Grey's Anatomy book. So I went up to Arcadia, who is the nun, and I said, you know, I could probably help you a little bit with this, and I'm welcome to stay. So she said, oh yes, please, please. So I kind of took over the class for her. And that's how I got involved. So I was thrown into it. I had never met a Latino person up to that point. I did not speak Spanish. I still don't speak it very well. I can understand a lot. But um, I didn't know anything about the culture. I didn't know anything about the community. I didn't even know if I wanted to teach English as a second language classes because I had never thought of doing it before. So within my first couple of weeks, I had all of these people coming to me with their problems because I was with the nuns, so there was kind of an almost instant trust base there. Mm -hmm. And I was getting asked to handle court cases, and I'm not an attorney, <laughs> who were asking me to go to court and straighten out problems. We had someone who needed brain surgery. I had somebody with a, a birth certificate that was incorrect. So all of a sudden, I was thrown into this community that I knew nothing about in a language I didn't understand with all of these issues and problems that they assumed I knew how to fix because I spoke English and I was born here. And to this day, that's still the case. I think all of us who work with this community get asked all kinds of questions with all of the, the issues and problems that they face and expect us to know how to solve them. Um, but that's kind of how I got started. And when I first started working in ESL classes, they were all men and no women, no families and um, very transient. I would see almost a different class every week for the first couple of years. And then over time, we gradually started having women coming to the classes, and they started talking about their children, and we had more family-based community. And that's pretty much what we have now. We have a fairly stable Latino community here. We do get some newcomers coming in from time to time, but most of these people have been here for 10, 15, even 20 years or more. Um, the fact that I never noticed them before doesn't say much about me because I never really even noticed Latinas till I started working with them when I started teaching ESL classes. And over the years as we started getting more families, they were asking me to help with their children because they were in the schools now. They were getting homework assignments they couldn't help them with. They were getting forms that were sent home. And even when they were in Spanish, and to this day, that's something we still face, even if it's in Spanish, they don't necessarily read in Spanish or they really don't understand what it's all about. So there was this huge disconnect between the families and the, and the, and the schools. So when the second Mono El Hermano started, um, I, we were trying to think of a program because we were kind of in a rut as far as what we wanted to do. And we had a gardening program, but we didn't really have a lot of else, other things going on. So understanding that there was a need for a literacy program, I approached the director we had at the time and said, you know, this is something I really want to do. And the board agreed to let me go ahead and experiment with this and get started. And so we started the Family Literacy Program. And that's where I met Jessica because, um, in fact, Chuck, who's sitting here tonight, I had called him on the phone. He's the counselor at Nags Head Elementary. And I said, who would I call or who would I talk to to get my foot in the door with the school system? And he recommended Jessica because she was the lead ESL coordinator at the time. So I met with her in the spring and said, this is something I'm thinking on doing. And I think she was very grateful to have the help, wasn't sure whether it was going to work or not, neither was I because I had never done anything like this before either. So over the summer I started thinking about how I wanted to run the literacy program. Um, after working within the community I realized that having a learning center was not the way I wanted to go. I didn't want people bringing their children or us transporting children to have them tutored. I wanted to kind of fit in with their culture and build on their strengths. And while they have a lot of challenges, I have to say their greatest strength is their unity of family and community. So I wanted to do a home-based program. I wanted to do home-based, one, it eliminates transportation, but two, it also, if you have somebody coming to your house on a weekly basis and showing that you care enough to show up and help that child with their education, it says something about the value of education. And the many challenges that they face are obvious, some of them the socioeconomic status, um, many of them live below the poverty line. Um, they also have the language barriers, they have the fear of authority and institutions to get over, 
and also most of them didn't receive an education in their home country, or a very limited one at best. I had many students when I taught ESL that had never gone to a day in school, and most of them had not finished the sixth grade. Sixth grade was almost like finishing high school and college in their countries because they had to quit to work to support the family. And that is one of our greatest challenges, I think, today, is to kind of overcome that idea of quitting and helping the family, that if you can get that high school diploma, you can help them a lot more. So that's one of the things that we're really trying to encourage, that they at least stay in school to get the high school diploma. And then make up your mind. If you want to go work, help the family for a while, great. But that's our overreaching goal, is to keep them in school. We currently serve about 60 families and over 100 children every week. We have about 35 volunteers, and many of them are here tonight. Um, everybody goes out to a home once a week and helps with homework assignments or projects or literacy skills that need to be reinforced. There's one of them. And there's <laughs> one of them. Yeah, there's Rosemary here tonight. There she is. And she works with a, a young little girl that I think she's fallen in love with. And, <laughs> And Susan has to, and there, I can name several of you here tonight, but our tutors get so involved with the families. And as I, and as I mentioned before, they have a very strong family unit. So when we go into the homes, they're very gracious, they're very welcoming. A lot of us get fed very well. Um, and a lot of our tutors take their children out to other field trips, to their own homes. It's becoming a real bonding experience for the Anglo community as well, because you normally wouldn't get to meet this community in such a close and up personal way, so it's a way for to form bonds. And that was one of my plans too. I kind of wanted to, I mean, I was understanding how wonderful this community was and how much they had to offer, but a lot of the people, even if you're empathetic towards them, don't always have the opportunity to meet and get to know them. Yeah. So with our tutoring program, we've really spread the word that this community has a lot to offer. Um, we also have, I mentioned briefly, we have a gardening program, and we just started this spring a children's plot. So we have children that are meeting every Wednesday in our community garden, and they're going to be growing food for their families. And it's a, it, they're having a ball. And I know nothing about gardening, but we have some really good gardeners who are helping us out. Tom is laughing because she knows even less than I do, I have found out. <laughs> She didn't even know what a strawberry and a rabbit was. <laughs> I thought it was a cherry, not a strawberry. <laughs> but it was a radish, apparently. <laughs> yeah, and this is little Alan. His tutor's here tonight. Susan's here. And she took him to the library to get his very first library card, which was exciting for him. He would never have had that opportunity had it not been for Susan taking him there. So, you know, our children get to go places they never get to go. We offer a year-round program. We have the academic year program, and we also have a summer program. We partner with the Coastal Federation, and they've been wonderful to us. They buy us our books. They give us a field trip. So our children have eight weeks of reading that, and activities that they wouldn't normally get because a lot of their parents are busy working. There's our garden right there. Yep. Our happy little gardeners. And we're planning to expand to Hatteras. That was one of the little deals we made under the table with Carlos. <laughs> we really wanted that program in Hatteras, and we really wanted Carlos on our board. So it, it works out for both of us. So we're going to start Hatteras in the fall. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yay. And we also started a parent program this year. Um, since the beginning, I wanted to do it's family literacy because we involve the entire family. And I wanted to have an educational program for the parents as well. And when I set this up, I had a very distinct picture in my mind of how I wanted that to look. I wanted the parents to be in the schools during the school day. Because if you come in during the school day where your children are going to school, you're going to feel a lot more comfortable going to parent-teacher conferences, all the activities that they do. You're going to feel a sense of ownership like you really belong. So we had a morning class on Wednesdays at Nags Head Elementary, and then we had the same thing in the afternoon at Manuel Elementary during the school day. And we had a wonderful group of moms that would come to that class, and they really enjoyed it, and we enjoyed teaching them. And Jessica co-taught the class with me in the morning, and Danielle, who's here, helped me in the afternoon with the Manuel class. And we plan to do that again next year. And once a month we went into the computer lab because some of the moms didn't know how to work a mouse on a computer, didn't know all these programs they send home. They're expected to sign in to new, you know, Raz Kids reading program. What's that? So we worked on the computer once a month also. And that was a huge success. And the schools have said they're welcoming us back again next year. They, they really enjoyed the program too. And that's how we've been measuring our success also. We see, you know, the, the tutors see, you know, the light in the eyes of the children every night, and we see the families receiving us. But the real 
feedback from the schools has been very helpful. The teachers have been really wonderful. Administrators have been really wonderful. Um, if I have a question or if the tutor has a question, I can ask a teacher what do you want us to work on and they send us answers. Or if the teacher knows that the child is being tutored, over and over I'll have teachers contacting me, can you work on this? I'm sending this home tonight, can you get this signed? So we've developed a real partnership with the schools and I think they see us as a resource now, which is wonderful. And um, I can't say enough good, good enough things about the Dare County Schools there. Um, briefly what I want to say too in terms of what Amma was touching on in you know most of the people that I work with are undocumented and do not have that path as Amma pointed out they just have no hope and most of the people in our community with all our first generation people are under almost all of them are under the age of 18 we have a different community than some of the cities do some of the cities have second generation people we really don't we have first generation under the age of 18 and their parents are what I call survivors. They're in survival mode. Um, they're doing the best they can with not having legal status. They try and follow the rules. They, most of them do pay taxes. They do everything they can to fit in, but they're always just going to be surviving unless the laws change. That's just the sad reality. So when I started this family literacy program, it was especially exciting for me. I love helping the survivors survive. But I wanted to help people thrive too. And that's where I see our children because they're thriving. They have the citizenship. They have the opportunities that their parents dreamed of. Because I was just recently reading a book I picked up on immigration and the same quotes from 100 years ago with the Irish and the Italians and everybody else. I come here because I want my children to have a better life. There is no hope where we are. I need that for my children. And that's when we asked our parent class, one of the moms wrote the almost the exact same quote. She said, I came here for my children because there was no hope where we came from. So I want everybody to keep in mind that, you know, we have children here who have a really a good chance of succeeding and that's why I'm helping them because if if we don't, then we get another generation of people who drop out of school and the cycle repeats itself. So we've got a golden opportunity here in Dare County to reach that first generation and really help them stay in school. So that's pretty much all I have to say. That kind of sums up the program. And we're always Beautiful. looking for volunteers, and I've got applications in the back. If anybody's interested, we train you. You don't need to speak Spanish. So I'm just going to put that little plug yeah. in before I sit down. But thank you for having us. Thank you all. We really learned a lot this evening, I think. And now we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, Anybody have a question? Uh, would you, should we come to the mic? I'm, I'm afraid they can't hear you if you don't. So, if you don't mind. And uh, while she's coming, who who else has a question? You can be next. Okay, you want to get in line? <laughs> <laughs> Not that line. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> <laughs> really, dude. <laughs> My question is for Ama. Yes. Um, what happens to the children? that are legal if the parents are arrested? So the, <laughs> um, either the parents take the kids back with them or the kids stay here. Um, and it really is up to, um, up to the parents. Um, immediately what happens to the kids is you know, they might not have anyone to take care of them. Um, that's something that we've really been trying to work with um, the community um, here on, is that you you never know when it is that ICE might come knocking on your door. You never know when it is that you might go to court for a traffic ticket um, and ICE is there at the courthouse waiting for you, like they've been doing in multiple places now. And so when that happens, who's gonna pick up your child from school? Who's gonna hire a lawyer for you? Um, who's gonna take your dog out? You know, things of that um, nature. So we're really trying to get the community to 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 put a plan in place so that if something does happen, if they do get picked up, that their kids are taken care of. What ultimately happens? Um, like I mentioned, um, the parent can. Um, can either take the kid with them or the kid stays here. Most of our parents, um, I don't want to say most of our parents, but from my understanding, a lot of the parents um, don't have passports for the kids. 
that's not something that the U.S. government would um, take care of. I mean, the parent has to be the one to get the passport for the kid. So to answer your question, what happens is chaos. Um, and I mean, each family situation is different, but we're, we're trying to make sure that they are as prepared as possible to make sure that the kids, you know, have, have some, some um, chance of um, minimizing the chaos that does happen if the parents are picked up. Does that answer your question? I know it kind of doesn't, because there really isn't a real answer to it. Like, you know, it just depends on the family. Um, but it's never a good situation when their kids involved and the parent is detained or deported. Yeah, now, go ahead. one good thing, like Kay said, their community so united, you know, that you see them a lot of them. The kids stay back. I mean, and they stay with uncles, aunts, family members who will ensure that they go to school. And we've met plenty of kids that they're introduced to us as that, you know, their little niece, their little nephew, you know, because they're either they came by themselves or they were left by themselves. So it happens a lot, yeah. Hi, I have a comment and a question. One, um, my comment is that um, for the last couple of years, I have been working with farm worker communities in Eastern North Carolina, and I have been amazed. You know, I've heard a lot about the H-2A visa, which is the agricultural uh, version of an H-2. And I was astounded to find out that of the farm workers in North Carolina, only 10% of them are here on H-2A visas, which means that the people who pick our food are 90% of them here illegally. I don't know how that transfers or how that relates to what, you know, in terms of service workers, construction workers, what we depend on here in Dare County, how many of them are here illegally and how many of them are legal. But I, my hunch is that it's the same ratio, 90 to 10 percent, um, 10 percent here illegally. And I wanted to make sure that people understood that. Um, I don't know for sure that that's the ratio, but I suspect that it is. Which means that the basically people is are you shaking your head? Is that right? No. Yes. You no, no. 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 I was shaking, saying I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, we don't. I, you know, I don't know that there are any statistics on that actually. Um, yeah. But it's my impression is it's the vast majority. Okay. My question is, what can people? My hunch is that there are a lot of people in this room who are concerned about this, and we are looking for concrete steps that we can take to help to do, move something in the community so that this becomes a more immigrant-friendly community. Do you guys have ideas on that? Well, first to answer your for, um, about the majority of them being illegal, I don't know if I, I wouldn't be able to tell you statistics by, right, yeah. but from experience, me and Hatteras Island, I run the department, uh, 500 plus houses. We have a number of vendors that we hire. And yeah, there is a lot of vendors or some that will hire some of their crews are not, they don't have a legal status. I would say from my experience visiting sites, um, maybe more like 50. Um, there is a lot, but what you said about the quality of work, I do have to say their quality of work is sometimes a little more um, notice than some of our local folks that have been here for quite a while because they get into the, well, you know, I can do it. You know, you know th there's such a few amount of that we can choose from that they, but, uh, um, but yes, there is a lot, and, and that's what I was saying earlier. It's frustrating for me as an employer trying to find people to work when I know they're out there, but I cannot hire them. What we plan to do, I mean, what I'm doing is, is basically this, um, spreading the word, ensuring that we as, as a community, as Ama said, we, we're thinking of the bigger picture sometimes, but yeah, we have to figure out for us here locally what, like you said, their county, they're keeping our our house is up for the most part. Some of them, if they don't go out there and, and fix a house, who is? <laughs> I'm serious. I can tell you that we don't have a lot of people that we can count on to hire, f you know, legally. So, um, but I, as education, preparation, I mean, these folks, the system has to be uh, reformed to where immigration law cannot be that much of a nightmare for somebody to want to come to a country to help. <laughs> it's the, I mean, they're, they're raising their hand and volunteer to come here, you know, and doing, going through what they're going. Some of them, I mean, I, I didn't mention earlier, but we had an experience at a house in Christmas where they showed us, they, they, they gave us a bag, a cotton bag. It was 
real um, like handmade cotton bag, and inside was a toast, flat toast made out of corn. That's what they eat when they come from Mexico. Why? Because it, I asked him, and I was like curious. I'm like, it was delicious. It was toasted. I mean, it, and I, what is this? Well, that's what we take with us because it lasts, you know, and we don't know how long we're going to be out there. We don't know if we're going to make it. So, I mean, these folks are going through that, and, 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 and I think that we need to, like you said, help, you know, all of us find, you know, volunteer at, like I said earlier, volunteer in the community, help whatever it is, help your community. You know, we expect a lot from our government, but we have to, our president said it, John F. Kennedy, right? Don't ask what the country can do for you, but what can you do for it? That's what we need to do is do more. Like I said, I mean, I, I, I'm not from here. I don't have, I'm, I, I mean, my kids are, are going to school here, and my, my, my investment is, if I, you know, would be that. But no, I cannot think like that because my kids are part of the community, and they have friends in the community, and they play basketball, they play music. They go, they're, you know, they're going different places in different parts of the country to Europe with this school system here. So our school system here in Durr County, I have to, like, you know, Kay said earlier, I can't give it enough credit because they do so much for our kids and for our community. And what we need to do is, as Kay said also, not just the migrant parents go to the school. We should be more, you know, be more active at the school. Our, 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 our kids' parents should be more active at the school, trying to figure out what their kids are learning. You know, ask for more classes. I mean, if they don't have enough teachers, we have volunteers, and volunteer too to help us teach your kids or other kids different languages, not just Spanish. It's, it's, it's very, I mean, it's, it's very essential for us to develop our brains from younger age. It's a lot harder for our tutors to go to the, to this, to the house and teach a 30, 20, 18-year-old to learn English, rather a six, seven-year-old. I mean, they learn in six months. They're talking English. Us adults, it'll take us about a year or so. And, and I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I answer your question, but my, my opinion and what I would do or what I would suggest for us or for you to help us is help us. You know, spread the word that Manuel Hermano is here to help our community. And we're, 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 we're here. So whatever you need, just. <laughs> and whatever you have, bring it. <laughs> we need money. Okay. So money is always. You do need money, guys. I'm, I'm honest. <laughs> Okay, um, let's take, uh, how many people have a question? Let's, let's take, all right, you, you be next, and then if, the, we'll take, let's say let's take two more, and then if oh, anybody yeah, else has a question, get more. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, I really enjoyed this presentation. What are the countries of origin of most of your Spanish-speaking people? I used to keep the statistics for Dare County Schools, and I'm just going to give a rough, I mean, I could pull up, I could look it up, but um, the majority, I'd probably say 95% are Latino. There's a, a, a sprinkling of, of Chinese that have been adopted or come here, and, and some East Europeans and some Albanians that won the diversity lottery, like Ghana's father did, but majority of Mexico, and then also Honduras. <laughs> Salvador, Guatemala, Peru. Colombia. Colombia, not too much yeah, from Colombia. Colombia. A few, oh, a few, yeah. but not, yeah. yeah Apparently yeah. Hatters. But that, that's the majority. Okay. And do many of them ask for asylum? From, I'm thinking Honduras, Ecuador. Countries. Okay, the central, the, okay, now I'm gonna get in trouble because I'm gonna tell you that I'm not the attorney. Okay. But if you if you are Me a Mexican citizen and cross the border, you cannot ask for asylum. Only the Central American countries can ask for asylum, and so that's why there was a, a wave of unaccompanied minors that they called it, that were crossing the border on purpose, giving themselves up because they knew they could ask for asylum. Now, asking doesn't mean you're going to get it, and so you have to sign in. You have to say where you're going to be. Like, like we had quite a few come in the last several years into even this year coming into Dare County Schools and they have to go report to the immigration authorities and there's no guarantee and once they're 18 they're adults so that status goes away automatically so I think there's a lot more hope you, that, that the asylum route will work for somebody than what it really does but it, you do get across the border if you're from Central America <laughs> and I just wanted to throw, just because you men, 
Shin Asylum, I do want people to know that that's, it's a very high standard yes. and a very long, complica complicated process to receive asylum in the United States of America, okay? And um, especially for Central American individuals, lately it's been even more difficult because the last few years um, we had so many people that were seeking asylum from Central America so it's become even harder um, and what else was I gonna I think that may have been all I was gonna it say. Is yes, difficult. It is difficult. I mean if you even think about difficult. the Iraqi interpreters that aren't getting right. asylum status you can imagine that somebody that's just crossing the border with yeah. a t-shirt on is not going to be given priority. And they have to have I mean, some sort of persecution or yeah, yeah, from the yeah, government. Per persecuted, yep. Um, I was going to ask, um, I had heard that there's also a prison system set up that's run privately. And therefore, if somebody were picked up here, they don't just send them back to Mexico. Okay. They go to a prison. <laughs> yes. And these are private prisons that have been <laughs> set up by the present administration. They make a lot of money doing this. And even in Charlotte, they cannot send their detainees to their own prisons. They go to these private prisons. Yeah. Is that accurate? So um, there are um, detention facilities that are run by the Department of Homeland Security. Well. Let me take that back. Department of Homeland Security facilities, but they but they are pr privately run facilities. So if someone gets picked up in Dare County today, they there's um, Charlotte Immigration Court, but there isn't a facility in Charlotte to detain the immigrants. So they're first sent down to South Carolina, and then for the most part, they're sent over to Lumpkin, Georgia, which is in the middle of nowhere, to Stewart Detention Center. Okay, that's where most of the, I, I can't remember whether it's a, a male-only facility, but that's where they're taken. It's in the middle of nowhere. You have no contact with your family, and I mean, you're down there within a matter of like two days. Um, and then they have, <laughs> they call them family detention centers. Most immigration advocates refer to them as baby jails because what these family detention centers are is they're supposed to help keep, you know, the moms with their kids, but they're not, I mean, they're jails. Our immigration advocates will, you know, go there, you know, and just want to, you know, talk to kids or, and they'll tell them, no, you can't give them candy. You can't bring them toys. You can't do this. You can't do that. Like, it is a baby jail. Um, so, anyway, yes. So, they're taken to faraway facilities. These faraway facilities are run by prison corporations. You know, um, I don't know whether you all, I, I mean, we have a couple of um, big corporations that, I mean, that's all they do. They run prison systems for the government. And I love Obama. He will be my president forever and ever. But this really became a big thing while he was president. Detention facilities became a big thing while he was president. You know, so it's something that um, was a huge problem when he was president, you know, and, and it's only going to get worse under our current administration with them trying to fill more beds in the detention facilities and with them trying to build more detention facilities. Um, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Let me just add one thing to that. There was a, a student whose father was deported. The mother, I mean, to what Amma was saying, didn't even know where the father was. I mean, took <coughs> weeks to even find to out where he him. was. Even, even, to locate, even to locate the father. So it's, it's rough. Uh, yeah, I had a question um, specifically regarding uh, actually interpreters. I had an uh, acquaintance um, back in college about two years ago, and uh, he served in Afghanistan. He grew really cl uh, close with an interpreter who I guess was assigned to their unit, some such thing. Um, and, and he talked a little bit in the class I was in with him about how 
lengthy and tortuous that process was before these insane travel bans. You know, the guy had been waiting five, six years in a country where he could potentially be held responsible for reprisals by people who didn't like that he was, you know, working with our armed forces. When these travel bans were instituted and then quickly, you know, uh, temporarily blocked, um, did that send everyone to the back of the queue? What effect did that have on... Uh, on the process of people who who say been waiting for Afghanistan and Iraq for you know X for refugee years. status, you mean? Yes. I don't I don't know that it actually did anything. I mean, I think, yeah, I don't know that it actually did um, anything as far as like um, sending people to the back of the queue, just because I mean you know um, again things were blocked <clears throat> so quickly. Um, I think things are just moving the way they're supposed to be moving. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, that's fine. Um, we'll see what happens come May May eighth. Um, I think it was and May sixteenth when we have the appeals hearings. Um, but you're so if the executive orders do go forward, then the answer to your question will be very different because things will be stalled for many of those refugees who have been in the process for so long and. Um, Refugee um, process is the most rigorous screening that the U.S. has for potential immigrants to the country. I mean, um, it takes um, an average of two years for the refugee status to be approved. Meanwhile, you're still in that country that you're trying to flee throughout this whole process of your status. Being, you know? So, um, anyway... Ask me again later this month. <laughs> the answer, right. hopefully it won't be different, but it might be. Right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Thanks for being here. It's been really enlightening. I worked as a legal assistant and um, in the criminal defense world and was um, really taken with the toll of the driving while license revoked charges. Mm. Um, and I guess... I purposely did not ask our clients any detailed information, but can you just give me the, the just a, what would be a typical situation oh whereby someone is here and working, generally paying taxes, but getting pulled over over and over and over again and getting these charges? I just didn't understand how that, how that all shook out. So that goes into an area of immigration that I absolutely love called crimigration because it's the combination of criminal and immigration. It's very complicated. Um, the answer to your question, you know, has to take a whole bunch of legal analysis because there are, um, of some of the bars that I mentioned, we also have criminal bars and um, good moral character bars, things of that nature. And so... Um, depending on whatever um, crime you've been convicted of, that could change whether or not you can gain um, lawful status, um, whether you can become a citizen, whether you will be deported. Driving while license revoked, I honestly don't remember the legal analysis of it now. But, I mean, when you think about driving while license revoked, you know, or pretty much most of the traffic violations we have, a lot of people don't really think that they're they're that serious, right? You're like, oh, I got caught driving my license revoked. Oh well, you know, let me pay this, you know, you know, fine. Let me do this class, and in one year I'll get my license back. Well, if you're a green card holder or undocumented, that could mean you're getting deported. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, I'll do the more precise legal analysis because it's been a while since I've done it, and then I can answer your. Well, it just seemed like such a tragedy that a person would be a member of the community, be employed, be paying taxes, sending their children to school, and can't drive to work and can't drive their children to school or drive to an appointment. Yeah, that's the that's, important thing. They can't even get a license, so yep. you're not there. If there's no, there's not even a twenty-year line to get in line to get a license. Yeah. And is that because there's no social security number? Correct. In North Carolina, you used to be able to get a driver's license with a tax ID number, and so you can still work with a tax ID number. And that way, then, and withholding is taken out, and it helps pay my Social Security and some of your Social Security, but the actual employee is never going to get any of it because it's not a Social Security number. 
So it's, it's kind of a strange thing that the IRS created mm -hmm. so that employers can deduct taxes and withholding but not ever give a social security number, thereby not ever right. being Right, so the um, employee uh, never gets the benefit of it. License. That's correct. But I do yeah. encourage parents to do that because they will have a record of having paid taxes. So when and if immigration reform does come around, they can prove that they were paying taxes and of they course. were employed. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, that's a question that, you know, we get quite a bit too, is, well, why won't they just get a license so they can stop being pulled over? Well, because they, they can't get a license because the state of North Carolina won't get let them get a license. I think there are, how many states are there that do allow undocumented? Maybe three. Washington yeah, Washington, Maryland. Maryland. Yeah. Yeah, Maryland. But it's, yeah, you California. They just can't California. get a license. Now, now, having the license doesn't take away the fact that, you know, some of those folks are getting, you know, screened just because they have a, a different, you know, I mean, uh, seriously, <laughs> I mean, there's, when you go to sometimes to some offices, there's, you know, two forms of ID requested where some folks are asked for that social security card because, you know, they want to make sure that they're actually citizens. So, I mean, just be, you know, and, and, and I had that experience happen to my wife and I. They asked her for a social security card, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I could show my two proofs of ID. Wow. Are there any more questions tonight? Uh, I'm Laurel I.D. Bernardo, if, if you don't know me already, and I'm uh, the co-president of the League of Women Voters here in Dare County, and this is what I love about my job here. There's so much to know and learn about this, and I really thank all four of you tonight. <laughs> for shining a light on a very, very important and very topical issue right now. We have, the more we learn about our community, the better. The more we reach out to our community, the better. There's a wonderful application here for tutors for <laughs> at Mono El Hermano here. And really, it will take you just a few minutes to fill that out. And I think they have more, many options for you to get involved with. Uh, really very, I met Jessica just a few weeks ago. And as a result, I started Googling immigration law in the United States. <laughs> That's because I had pro trouble sleeping at night. And <laughs> the maze and the stories that I read and the ways that we've gone and the quotas and the this and the that. I'm also a child of immigrants, so it's close to me. And I think the more we learn, the better. The more we reach out, the better. And I thank you so much for this evening. Thank um, you. Um, yeah. Also, one thing I want to tell you, and again, I can't tell you how happy and pleased I am. I have light, uh, shine a light pens for each of you, and that's, they're highly sought in the Dare County area. <laughs> don't leave without it. I'm sure our speakers, our speakers will stay a few minutes if you have something else to discuss with them, but don't forget, later this month, the League has a program called Being Your Own Best Healthcare Advocate, which is, uh, we have five local uh, physicians talking about how to take care of you or your loved ones when they're facing a medical crisis, and that, I think, will be really a hot topic, too. And that is on, mark your calendar, May 18th at noon, May 18th at noon at the Balm Center, real close by, okay. So, with that all being said, I thank you again, and I thank all of you for coming tonight and attending, and have a great evening. Thank you for having us. Yeah. That was fun.